Hello to all physics enthusiasts and fans of physical experiments. I'm Andrei Shednikov, and in today's video, we will focus on the main types of heat transfer, of which there are three. This is the transfer of thermal conductivity, convection, and heat energy through radiation in a system, and we will now inform you about them in sequential order. I will begin with a classic experiment in which multiple bolts are connected to a brass rod placed on wax. I will then proceed to heat the end of the rod using a gas burner. I ignite the gas burner and the initial bolt practically detached immediately. Let's wait a bit longer. The second bolt has detached and the heat is slowly spreading along the rod and the heating area. Now the third bolt has disappeared, let's wait a little while longer and the fourth bolt has also fallen down to the ground below us. Metals are excellent conductors of heat, as we have just confirmed. If we resided in a dwelling with walls made of metal, heat would dissipate rapidly through these walls during the winter season. Therefore, the walls of houses are made of materials with low thermal conductivity whenever possible. Wood, concrete, brick. And in order to comprehend how walls retain heat, we require the fundamental law of thermal conductivity, which states that the heat flow through a wall is greater when the temperature difference on either side of the wall is greater and is lesser when the wall is thicker. When heating our home, how much heat is lost through walls to the outside? An equal amount needs to be supplied by burning fuel or via the HVAC system. Right now it's 20 degrees Celsius inside the house, zero outside, with a temperature difference of 20 degrees. If the outside temperature drops to minus 20, the temperature difference will double, and therefore the heat flow through the walls will double, requiring twice as much heat to be expended. If the walls of the house were twice as thick, the heat flow at the same temperature difference would be half as much and the heat loss would be reduced by half. But of course, it's better not to excessively increase wall thickness, but to use insulation with low thermal conductivity. In order to investigate the thermal insulating properties of polystyrene, I adhered it to a jar and affixed three temperature sensors to the jar for measurement and analysis. One on the polystyrene material, one directly on the glass surface, and one actually placed inside the jar container itself. We pour hot water into the jar, the water comes into contact with the temperature sensor inside and it rapidly rises to over 90 degrees, reaching a high temperature in a short amount of time. And at this moment, the temperature of the sensor, which is connected to the glass, started to slowly rise. And here is what we see after three minutes of the experiment. The sensor inside the jar quickly heated up to 94 degrees and then showed a gradual decrease in temperature of the cooling water. The sensor attached to the glass reached a temperature of 60 degrees after a minute and did not heat up further. The sensor connected to the polystyrene material achieved a stable temperature of 36 degrees Celsius just after a duration of three minutes. Why did the external sensors indicate a temperature stabilization at 60 and 36 degrees, despite the fact that three cans still had a significantly higher temperature in the recent past? The fact is, in order for heat transfer to happen through a substance, there must be a difference in temperature. Otherwise, the heat transfer would be non-existent. So why is polystyrene such a good thermal insulator? The reason lies in the fact that polystyrene is essentially a foamed material with a large portion being air, and the thermal conductivity of air is very low because air has a very low thermal conductivity. And although, as Andre has already mentioned, air has very low thermal conductivity, it nevertheless effectively facilitates another type of heat transfer or convection. Here, right beside me, there is a heater with a rod that has been installed on it, and on the rod there is a spiral coil hanging. And at this moment, I will proceed to insert the plug of the heater into the electrical outlet in order to power it up and generate heat. At this stage, our coil slowly heats up, causing the snake to start moving with its speed gradually increasing as a result of the heating process. What is the reason behind this occurrence? It happens because the air surrounding the coil gets heated up, leading to a decrease in its density. Consequently, based on Archimedes' law, 
The air that is warmer initiates an upward movement within the cooler surrounding air, as stated. This is how the flow rises, forming a rising flow that spins the coil in a swirling motion. These ascending air currents are clearly visible when placing the heater between the lamp and the screen. And this phenomenon occurs because, along with the change in air density, the refractive index of the air also undergoes a transformation. It is evident that thermal convection can take place not just in the atmosphere, but also in the liquid. I placed a jar of water on the heater, and to observe the convective currents, I added a bit of manganese dye to the bottom. And from the bottom, streams of colored water rise up due to the expansion of water when heated, similar to how air expands when it is heated. And now I will demonstrate a model of a water heating convection system. Here, a hose is connected to the glass tube, creating a closed loop that is entirely filled with water throughout the entire system. The glass tube will be heated by a nichrome coil. To ensure the resulting convection currents are clearly visible, I will fill the bottom part of this tube with water colored using a syringe. This allows for easy observation and analysis of the convection process. We pass an electric current through the coil and the water in the glass tube begins to increase in temperature. The density of water here decreases and the flow of water in the other knee now has a greater weight. Thus, the water ascends on the right side and descends on the left side. Consequently, the water moves in a circular motion within the pipe and the dye gradually disperses throughout the entire volume. Now let's observe how air convection takes place inside a room. Fresh cold air from the windows moves downward, which is the reason why the windows are positioned at the top, nearer to the ceiling. Heated air from radiators, on the other hand, rises upwards, so radiators placed at bottom closer to floor for efficient heating. Due to the established circulation, the air mixes throughout the entire room, resulting in a uniform distribution. Now I will demonstrate to you the significant efficiency advantage of convection over conduction. And for this purpose, we have assembled this setup. Here, a tilted glass tube is filled with water. Two temperature sensors are inserted from below and above it, while in the middle it will be heated by a nichrome coil, which you have previously seen and are familiar with. And we see that 30 seconds after the start of the experiment, the process of convection began in the upper tube. And after a time period of two minutes, the upper sensor displayed a temperature reading of 75 degrees Celsius. And the temperature of the lower sensor during the same period experienced almost no significant change. And here the water in the upper half of the tube has already boiled. While I calmly touch the lower part with my hand, it's practically cold. And now, another amazingly beautiful experiment related to convection. For this experiment, we took silicon oil PMS-10 and added a bit of aluminum powder to it. Poured the resulting mixture onto the bottom of the pot in a thin layer and gently heated it up. And take a look at what we've got. The thin layer of oil quickly breaks up into convective cells, also known as Bernard cells, which are a well-known phenomenon in fluid dynamics. In the center of each cell, the heated oil rises upwards, where it releases its heat to the surrounding air and then descends down along the edges of the cell. The addition of aluminum powder enables clear visibility of the oil flow. Similar convective cells can be observed on a cosmic scale on the surface of the sun, just like the one seen when aluminum powder is added to the oil. They attain dimensions of several hundred kilometers, and they are formed because the interior of the sun is significantly hotter than the surface, and convection guarantees the efficient transfer of heat from these depths to the outside. Alexei told us about convection on the sun. The warmth from the sun doesn't reach us through convection or conduction because there is a vacuum in space between the earth and the sun, but through radiation. And now we will have a discussion about this topic in terms of the transfer of heat and its implications. And now I am starting the experiments with radiation. And the first experiment will be like this. Here I have two identical metal plates hanging but one of them is a mirror, and the other one is charred black. There is a heater and a reflector. I position these plates towards the heater and switch it on to activate the heating process. And we will see what will happen to the temperature of both plates. And after three minutes, the smoked plate heated up to 62 degrees Celsius, while the mirror one only reached 39 
We see that a black surface absorbs heat much better than a mirror surface. And now I will provide evidence to demonstrate that a black body not only absorbs heat more efficiently, but also emits it more efficiently. Let's take into consideration a closed room where all objects are in thermal equilibrium, meaning they have reached the same temperature. And this signifies that every object emits an equivalent quantity of energy as it absorbs. A black object absorbs more pure energy than a white one. Therefore, it also emits more energy than a white one. Here are all the proofs. Now it is the time to discuss the thermos, the flask of which was invented in the late 19th century by the Scottish scientist James Dewar in order to store liquefied gases at low temperatures and preserve their properties for extended periods of time. The flask of a thermos or Dewar vessel has a double wall. The spaces between the walls are evacuated of air, which eliminates heat conduction and convection. And the walls themselves are coated with a layer of silver on the inside in order to minimize heat transfer through radiation as much as possible. And now I will perform a key experiment with two parabolic mirrors. In the focal point of one mirror, there is a heat receiver with a built-in temperature sensor. And situated at the focal point of yet another mirror, there is a piece of copper. My intention is to apply heat to it by utilizing a gas burner and observe its reaction. The thermal infrared radiation from a heated object placed at the focus is reflected by a paraboloid and transformed into a beam of parallel rays. And this beam is reflected from the second paraboloid, converges at its focal point, and generates heat in the heat receiver. Throughout this experiment, the temperature of the receiver increased from 26 to 54 degrees Celsius, nearly by a total of 30 degrees. And now I will conduct another experiment, and instead of a heated object, I will place a massive steel cylinder here, cooled in the freezer compartment of the refrigerator. And within 10 minutes of the experiment, the temperature of the receiver dropped by almost a whole degree. Then I rotated the mirror with the cooled cylinder to the side, and the receiver promptly began to heat up again, returning to room temperature. So did the cooled cargo emit cold rays that, upon reflecting off two mirrors, were able to reach the heat receiver and transfer their cooling effect? Or did the process occur in a different manner? Share your thoughts on this in the comments section of this video on YouTube.